Hey Beth, you are going to be my test audience. Um, can you see me and hear me okay? And um, if you can, just give a thumbs up or raise your hand. Okay, thank you, that worked well, appreciate it. and officially welcome you to the South Carolina Adopt-A-Stream and Higher Ed webinar. My name is Katie Callahan and I work at Clemson University. I've worked here for 14 years, which is mind-blowing to me. Um, I've had the very good fortune these past four years to co-lead the South Carolina Adopt-A-Stream program. Uh, this program is so relevant right now. We're hearing stories about water and water shortages and policy questions across the country. And my um, personal passion and the purpose of our center is to bring more voices, engaged and aware voices into that conversation because our water resources are so critical, not only to our life right now, but the economic, the natural health of our environment for our future generations. And so to me, there's no more important conversation to have than how we affect our water resources. And if we're not doing this all together as a larger community, then um, we're really missing the chance to make changes um, at the at the local level and, and bring more awareness um, towards those longer term changes like policy um, impacts that we can make when working together uh, to protect our waterways. Um, all right, I will go ahead and share my screen. 
I think you can hear me well. If there's any kind of technical difficulties, please just send me a note. Um, but again, welcome to our webinar. We're so glad you're here. Anyone who's indicated that they would like to receive more information about becoming a volunteer will be following up with you after today. And you'll have my contact information. Um, we hope to do this webinar again, featuring other university examples of how citizen science is being plugged in to higher ed programs, whether that's service learning, career skill development, research, we want to be able to showcase South Carolina's examples um, as, as really pilots for, for programs similar across the country of how universities can engage. So with that, I will go ahead and, and share my screen like I promised. <laughs> okay. Okay. And you should see um, a young girl in front of the glass at an aquarium uh, right here. And I wanna keep our participant window up and chat window. Thank you. Okay, so I have, again, the very good fortune of um, directing our Center for Watershed Excellence at Clemson University and um, directing, co-leading our major project, which is South Carolina Adopt-A-Stream. And you can find more information about the program at www.seadoptastream.org. This program is co-led between Clemson and South Carolina DHEC. Um, and Clemson as a center, as a designated center by EPA and DHEC, seek to build more science-based tools that broaden our reach and representation in watershed management across the state of South Carolina. As a pilot for other states, um, the, the designation program is a pilot in itself um, of how we can partner across our landscape um, to improve watershed management. So our our cornerstone project that we've been working on since 2017 is South Carolina adopt a stream Again, co-led between South Carolina DHEC and our center here. This is a citizen science water quality and ecosystem monitoring program from the mountains to the coast. And what citizen science is, it's an involvement of traditionally non-professional scientists in the collection of data towards the scientific process or towards a research program. So non-professionals that are being involved in science data collection. And more and more in South Carolina, um, we're talking about weather, we are talking about water. Uh, that's been happening for a few years now. If you're not paying attention to the weather and its impacts, it's it's you know been, been really in our face um, for the past uh, several years. So we have, this program is is a cornerstone is to build awareness and we'll touch on that in a minute but as far as it being increasingly relevant we have more than 1500 certifications delivered on uh, the center and dhec work with our critical training partners across the state to train volunteers in a six-hour workshop to monitor their waterways and that database is that data is collected into a centralized database um, that we all share. So there's many ways to be involved in the Adopt a Stream program, either as a hub, that's really a, 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 a center of energy for our program, where that hub provides kits, provides uh, host trainings, maybe not necessarily a trainer, but they host trainings, they help the volunteers and mentor them, answer their questions, and really are, are bringing the energy of this program to their area where it might not exist already. Training partners are um, usually have a scientific background, are passionate about the outdoors and data collection, and help us. They are the face of the program to their local community, training those volunteers and being their direct contact. And then sponsors are critically needed for this program. Um, we received EPA grants to initiate both the Tidal Saltwater Program more recently, as well as the Freshwater Program. But without sponsors, uh, we couldn't provide the local the kits to local volunteer groups to monitor. So um, if any of those areas of support interest you, please follow up with me. So what do we monitor for? Volunteers um, are really brought into the program primarily for awareness. We want to be able to build a better connection between residents and how land use changes affect our waterways, either in a river geomorphology concept or water quality, and as well as how, to, how do our human interactions affect our natural ecosystems and why should we care? So the program at its core is an educational program. But in addition, we do have a QAPP, 
quality assurance project plan that says that the integrity of our data is sufficient for baseline data collection and local action. So our database is rigged so that when there is a situation that might be indicative of water pollution, an alert is sent to a local city or county for them to follow up on. And that's where the regulatory aspect comes in. So our data, as it's collected by a volunteer, is not regulatory. Again, primarily education and baseline data collection, often on smaller streams that aren't monitored by the state. And um, local action is taken by that delegated authority if they're a municipal separate storm sewer system uh, permittee or state uh, DHEC office. And that's the list. We have three different protocols, freshwater, which is our chemical, physical, bacteria data collection, macroinvertebrate. Both of them include a stream habitat assessment, so we can get some restoration um, information. You know, uh, where are our failing stream banks? Where can we come in and maybe restore our rivers? Um, as well as the tidal saltwater, which just really started this past summer with our first trainers along the coast being trained to deliver that program to saltwater volunteers. And where are we? Um, you can see from these pins, the pink, the coral color is sampled over a year ago, yellow sampled within the last year and purple sampled within the six months. So our coastal program is really starting to ignite. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, and the involvement of our coastal community or coastal volunteers. And then you see in the upstate, the program really started very fast and strong in the upstate. Um, COVID was a setback for this program as far as volunteers having access to kits. And so we are um, doing a very targeted, uh, intentional effort to bring those volunteers back to the table, get them recertified. And that's where our online recertification comes into play. But just this year, so far, we're not we're not done yet. 404 monitoring events collected this year by citizen scientists. And the last time I calculated the the dollar value of volunteer contribution to our water resources, it was well over thirty thousand dollars between volunteer time and mileage uh, uh, to their monitoring site. So, at this point, I kind of want to reflect a little bit on you know, beyond the data, so we can talk about how many volunteers, how many monitoring events, how many sites, um, what is citizen science doing for us as both scientists and as humans living amongst other humans in this natural world? And, and how is it meeting, why is it important and how is it meeting new demands? And, you know, me at Clemson, I'm not, you know, the I'm not getting mixed up for college as a college student anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> so, but fortunately, I'm fortunate to be here. But um, we are amongst the generation that grew up with Google, that grew up with having some kind of apparatus, computer, phone, tablet available to see what is the health. How do I answer this question? I have a question. Where do I find the answer? And I can look it up on my phone. Google is a verb. Now I can I can search this and find the answer. But water quality data has always been a little bit out of reach, right? So especially regulated, regulatory water quality data, not immediately at your fingertips. So what citizen science program has the potential to do is meet that demand and that interest for data access real time, very local, collected by your peers in a very transparent way where everyone's being trained in the, in the same method, using the same methods and the data is online for anyone to look at. And that is this, the strength of our database, the photo, the image that you see here of um, this data that's able to be downloaded by anyone anywhere and put in an Excel sheet, graphed further, analyzed further, but you can look up where's the local station in, in my town and how healthy is the waterway and, and you have some information right there at your fingertips. You also have in this top left picture at local accountability. So where a volunteer has detected a sewer service, so a sewer light, a sewer leak, an active sewer leak, local authorities were immediately contacted that problem could be resolved. And that's not only hugely motivating for the involved volunteer that they had 
the opportunity to make an impact, but it definitely uh, means cleaner water quality. And in this case, drinking water source um, for our, all of our residents. So what motivates, lots of research opportunities there, but what motivates the volunteers and knowing that they're, they're putting time and effort or even their own money towards something more meaningful that they have the potential to make a change is, is hugely motivating. And we're changing maybe some, uh, potential apathy between how we manage our resources and, and the difference that we can make as individuals. Also changing the way we do business is, is who is involved in citizen science and how does it affect their careers? And so I'm really excited for to have our speakers here today uh, to share their stories with you. But citizen science, giving people uh, values, numbers to describe their concerns to local authorities, bridging the gap between our rural communities and our urban communities, our upstream and our downstream, and how we manage our resources, coming to some kind of understanding that's based upon science, giving people those tools to have those conversations, that's gonna change the way that we interact, that we engage, that we bring more voices to the table in our resource management and, and make change happen. And then also through citizen science, there's starting to be more research on how exposure to citizen science programs can change career paths. So maybe changing the demographic, the traditional demographic of the environmental science career profession. And so that exposure and hands-on exposure and in an exciting environment can really change kind of you know, the, the traditional maybe career choices that people have felt they have had over time, exposing them to new ideas and, and bringing a better representation of our population into uh, science and engineering fields. So um, there's more research that needs to be done there. I'm very happy to be a part of this, and I'm even more happy to have our local uh, folks share their stories of their involvement with the South Carolina adopt a stream program and how it's impacted uh, their, um, their college career and beyond. So our first speaker today is Alexis McFadden. And uh, Alexis, let me jump over to your bio as you pull up your screen. Alexis is a senior biosystems engineering student and the president of Clemson's Adopt a Stream team, which you can find on Instagram, just uh, Clemson Stream Team, if you want to follow them. Some of her passions include water quality monitoring and community service. She's here to today to discuss the Adopt a Stream program, including how she got involved, how it was positive has positively affected her life and potential ways that we can grow. Um, Clemson Stream Team, I think, is, a, is a, an amazing example of how universities can embrace this program and, and make it work for them. Um, so I'm so glad to hear from Alexis. So Alexis, are you having any, maybe I need to stop sharing for you to share? Yes, let me see. Okay, I'm sorry. I was hogging. <laughs> <You're fine. laughs> okay, thank you, Alexis. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, okay. So this, um, I, today I just want to talk about uh, my adopter stream journey. Um, so like Katie said, my name is Alexis McFadden, um, and I'm here because I love a doctor stream. And I wanted to spread its influence across the state and beyond. So that's why I'm here today to talk to you guys about it. So just for a bit um, about me, um, I am from Irmo, South Carolina, which is right around Columbia, right around the capital. Um, like Katie said, I am a senior at Clemson. I'm, I'm a biosystems engineering major. Um, so basically in biosystems, we design ways to achieve our goals. Um, whether it be structural, mechanical, any kind of goals like that. Um, but we want to make sure that our environmental impact is kept to a minimum. So we don't want to leave any sort of footprint behind um, our environment. I'm also a sustainability minor. Um, to me, sustain sustainability has so many definitions. But to me, and what I want to study, it is combining environmental and social justice efforts to ensure uh, that we have quality resources for future generations to come. I'm also the president and the social media leader of the adopt -a stream team and I'm the service chair of the Biosystems Engineering Club. 
So as president of the adoptive stream team, I help lead the samplings. Um, I help plan sampling dates and other events, including social events and trainings. Um, I help keep records. Um, I teach new members how to sample. I also coordinate with other groups who want to get involved, um, whether that be Biosystems Club, ROTC has been interested a little bit um, in sampling, so things like that um, are all part of what I do as president. And this image is just of me um, showing some new members how to sample using a white background and see the color changes. Um, I'm also the social media leader of Stream Team. So I take photos at each sampling um, and I manage an Instagram page um, that helps promote student and community engagement with the program. We have about 200 followers, which is very exciting. It's cool to see so many people be interested in the program. Um, and I also create advertising pieces for samplings and other events. Um, and then as service chair of Biosystems Engineering Club, I plan and execute service events, including Adopt a Highway and Adopt a Stream, which is super cool. Um, and to see how other clubs can get involved with Adopt a Stream. Um, and then we also coordinate with other groups who want to participate in service projects. And this image is just me and some of my friends at Adopt a Highway. So how did I get interested in water quality? Um, so I've always enjoyed being in nature from like a really young age. I grew up like climbing trees, swimming a lot, stuff like that. So I've always been really fascinated with nature and how it works. Um, and I noticed that there, were, there was a large amount of current news stories about how our water quality supply or how the quality of our water supply is decreasing. Um, I found out about this program specifically uh, through RISE, which I'll talk about a little bit what that is later. Um, and I wanted to be a part of the solution. So seeing those news stories and knowing that I loved nature, I wanted to really help pres uh, preserve it and protect it and make sure that it's safe. And again, make sure that future generations have the same access that we do. And I really liked this quote from Leonardo da Vinci, uh, water is the driving force of all nature. I really resonated with this just because I feel like with water um, being essential to everything that we do, which I'll talk about some more later, um, it's just important that we make sure that we keep it safe and we protect it at all costs. Um, and this image in the background is actually of the stream that we sample in the botanical gardens. So a little bit about adopt a stream. Um, Katie already talked about this, so I'll kind of skim through it, but um, basically it's a citizen science program that provides essential data about our waterways. Um, it educates the public about water in, in South Carolina, and it raises awareness of how humans impact our water. And it's a great way for everyone to get involved, whether you're a student or any, like, I mean, anybody can join an upstream. It's really fun. So some of the things that we monitor um, so the first part is physical and chemical monitoring, monitoring or freshwater monitoring. So these are just different water quality parameters that we test for, air temperature, water temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, and E. coli bacteria. And then for the macroinvertebrate monitoring, um, we use the different types and amounts of macroinvertebrates present in the stream to determine the level of water quality. So some of the things that we look for are mayflies and stoneflies, ripple beetles, water pennies, um, all sorts of creatures that we find. Um, and basically what we do is we, there's like a chart that shows, um, it shows based on their level of tolerance for whatever toxins might be in the stream. Based on that, you want the highest um, level of, of intolerance. Um, and that shows you that the stream is healthy. And then this image is just of a crawdad that we found one year. So for stream team specifically, um, how did stream team get started? It started as a program at Clemson University. Um, Clemson has a program called Residence in Science and Engineering, which is also short to RISE. Um, so stream team started in 2017 through RISE. Dr. William Martin runs it. Um, it was just a way for first year students to meet up and learn about how to test streams through the Adopt a Stream program. Um, and then it grew into a larger group 
once um, older members can continue to come back um, to continue sampling. And now we have around 20 members um, that includes first year through senior level students. Um, we even had some extra lab students and grad students come back. So it's really cool to see how this program is impacting their lives so much they want to come back for years and years. So what does stream team do? Um, we have one sampling per month. So we do physical monitoring and then macroinvertebrate monitoring. The physical chemical takes place every month and the macroinvertebrate takes place quarterly. Um, then we also host social events. So some of these include skills night. This uh, photo at the bottom is of our trivia night one year that was very successful. Um, we're planning a Christmas party right now. We have lunches. So we're, we try to make the event, these, this program as fun as possible as well. You know, I mean, not that the sampling isn't fun, but we're trying to make it as social as possible so we can all become friends and hang out through a doctor stream. Um, and I feel like hosting skills nights and trivia nights really increases engagement with the program, specifically throughout the university. Um, you can see all these students in this picture, not all of them were from RISE, some of them, came from other grade levels um, to come and check us out, which is really cool. So how are we organized? Um, so I'm the president, as we stated before. Um, Jeanette Fantone is the vice president. So she helps with keeping records like attendance, shirt sizes, um, contact information, um, things like that. And she also helps keep the kids organized, which is a very important part of Dr. Stream. So I'm very grateful to her for doing that. Just making sure that all of our chemicals are up to date, not, none of them are expired, make sure the kids stay organized, and make sure we have everything in there. Um, I'm also the social media leader right now. Um, so like I said before, I run the Instagram page, take photos, create advertising program, advertising equipment. And then we have um, an event planning committee, which is made up of a few different people, um, but they help with planning events. <laughs> And then, like I said, we meet um, we meet once a month, but more specifically, we meet twice over one weekend. So on Saturdays is when we do our sampling at the Tanopal Gardens. Sometimes when we have a larger group and more cars, we'll, we'll test JC Park as well, but it's usually the Botanical Gardens. Um, and then on Sunday is when we count bacteria and enter the data into the database. So a little bit about how a doctor stream has, has impacted my life. So it helped me decide what I wanna study and do in the future. And I'm incredibly grateful to this program for helping me determine what I want my life to look like. Um, so basically I want to expand my knowledge in streams, watersheds and water quality. Um, I'm planning on going to grad school um, eventually. I don't know when that's gonna happen, but um, I would definitely want to study streams and watersheds and water quality. So I'm very grateful to this program because I would not have known that I had wanted to do that if I hadn't gotten this experience with this program. And another one of my career goals is to help more women and um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color become interested in this field. So here are a few um, statistics that I found from Zipia, which is a career um, exploration website. So currently there were 56,000 environmental engineers employed in the United States and 64.9% of them are male, only 29.3% of them are female. And then 62.9% are white and the other percentage um, is people of color, which I think that disparity is kind of shocking um, just because I feel like women and people of color have so much, they should have more influence in the world of water quality. Um, the UN was, I was reading an article today actually about how in lower income countries, women are responsible for gathering water and taking care of the water and making sure everything is clean. And I think it's strange that they have such an impact on water in those countries, but here in the US, we don't have that much influence. Um, so I think it's very important um, that we have more representation for women in BIPOC in the field of water quality, environmental engineering, biosystems engineering, all of those things. Um, I think it's very important that we get different perspectives from different people who have had journeys in life that are different than others. Um, yeah. So for Dr. Stream in the community, 
So some of the things that we do with Stream Team and Dr. Stream as a whole is we do outreach. So we like to spread information to the surrounding community. Um, an example of this is was through Forest Fest. Um, this is our vice president, Jeanette Fantone. Um, she's explained dissolved oxygen and how that works to two little girls um, at Forest Fest. I believe this was two years ago in 2019. Um, so this, that's just one example of the things that we do. I mean, like I said, ROTC likes to come and uh, sample sometimes. Um, Biosystems Engineering Club comes and samples sometimes. And we're trying to get more clubs interested, which is part of what the um, Instagram is. Help, hope, hopefully, we'll get, we can get more people involved in that. Um, and we would like to have more areas in South Carolina and other states participate in Adopt a Stream. So not just the upstate. The map that Katie showed had so many sampling sites in the upstate. And I see that the coastal sites are also increasing too, but that middle part section is kind of missing. So I think it'd be really cool if we could find some ways to get other universities, maybe USC, Columbia, um, to really join in and have some fun with us with the Dr. Stream. And then other clubs and organizations, I know um, like churches could get involved. Um, high schools could even get involved, not just colleges and universities. So I think that would be really cool um, if we could get some more outreach involved. Um, and then why should you care about water quality? Water impacts our, day, our lives every single day. And that includes, but isn't limited to drinking, hygiene, irrigation of crops, manufacturing, in energy, transportation, and recreation. And it's important that we do everything that we can to protect this invaluable resource. Water is such a big, I'm gonna keep emphasizing this, water is such a big part of our lives. And I think it is incredibly important that we do everything we can to take care of it, especially for those future generations. So how can you get involved? Um, so since Adopt a Stream is a citizen science program, anyone can find a way to get involved. Um, so here are a few, examples, so shameless plug and Dr. Stream team at Clemson University, please join us. We'd love to have you. Um, we take anybody who wants to come and join and check us out. Um, and then more broadly in South Carolina, you can start a Dr. Stream group in your own area. Um, a Dr. Stream has kits that you can rent out and borrow. So if you find a site that you wanna sample and you have a group of safe group of people that you would like to sample with, you can definitely go out and um, sample something on your own. Um, and then for outside areas, outside of South Carolina, you can contact your local leaders and ask about starting up an adopt machine program. I know this program started, um, or it was adapted from one in Georgia. So that's already across state lines. So maybe North Carolina could start or any, I mean, anywhere could start. It would be so cool if we could have outside people doing it. So if you're from outside of South Carolina, please contact your local leaders um, and ask them about starting water quality programs. Um, that'd be great. And I think it's also very important for um, citizens to have access to this information because like Katie was saying, um, the education is so important to know what kind of water that you have in your area, know what you're drinking, what you're washing yourself with, what you're cooking with, that's so important. So if you have a Dr. Stream programs or programs similar to a Dr. Stream in your area, you will have you will be more empowered to have this information and make those decisions for your own life. So yeah, thank you. Um, so this is my contact information. It's um, mcfad5 at g.clemson.edu. And then this is our Instagram at Clemson Stream Team. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to email me, DM us, leave it in the chat here. I'd really be happy to get involved with you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lexis. I'm so impressed with your presentation and your sharing today. And so if I think we have a little bit of time so uh, that Mallory, I'm not cutting into your time today, but just a couple of reflection points. And then I see there will be some questions um, coming in. I really want to call out um, that uh, some of the research questions that you, if you lead a citizen science program at your university or at your local agency, some of the frustrations are, okay, my volunteer has monitored for three years and now they're gone. Why did they leave the program? How do I keep them motivated? 
that is that is a question or how do I keep my volunteers monitoring on a regular basis? So our program asks folks to monitor on a monthly basis. That's a, that's a time commitment. And it's usually best to be held accountable that with that time commitment by working within a group or working with a partner. And so I will say that Clemson Stream Team has the second most events in all of the Lake Hartwell watershed um, in our area of the state beyond Anderson Regional Joint uh, Sewer and Water Authority. So uh, you all keep each other accountable and keep each other monitoring. I love the Saturday Sunday count because one of the questions that we ask ourselves as, as program coordinators is how important is a social network to people feeling motivated to continue in this program and and there's a lot of research questions on that we actually just are conducting our annual motivation survey to identify do you monitor alone do you monitor with it within a group how important is it to you that you are part of something larger do you feel like your data can impact local decision making so those kinds of factors and, and whether they're motivating how important they are to the continuation of citizen science programs to, to be able to say that citizen science programs can collect years of data at a single point and location. Those, that is, that's a game changer for how citizen science can rep, be represented amongst other data sources in state level, federal level decision making. I mean, even EPA is looking at citizen science data and for um, incorporation into reports and into policies. So, but you need years worth of data for a lot of things. And so, you know, can crowdsource data culminate to that level of influence? So the importance of a social network, having that rigor uh, to be out there and, and work as a team, keeping each other even accountable to um, the integrity of the data that you're collecting. I do, um, there is a lot of research that's starting Alexis and, and how well does our citizen science population, um, how similar is it to our state population? That's something that we'll be looking at. So are we, is our population of, of volunteers representative of our state's population? And in, you know, that translates to, are we monitoring equitably and are we monitoring in areas um, that have a history of perhaps environmental justice or environmental racist, racism issues? And so, you know, a, a large, a larger engaged community is going to change the equity of our volunteer of base and our monitoring data resolution across the state and really maybe hopefully leading to some important changes. So that's why I keep saying, you know, how does citizen science change the way we do business? It's, you know, as natural resource managers, as scientists, but as humans, how is it, how can it change the way we do business or the face of, of who is doing this business. So um, let's go to just a few questions. We have a question of how many sites does the stream team monitor and how do you choose your sites? And um, what is involved with the skills challenge? If you would take those two on, three on. Um, so for the sites, we do um, mo mainly the botanical gardens, which is a part of Honeycutt Creek. Um, but we have done JC Park and Nettles Park, and that usually depends on how many people are at an event. So if we only have around um, like 10 or so people who come to one meeting, um, we'll just do the botanical gardens. But if we have like the whole 20 or over 20, you know, sometimes people bring friends and everything, um, then we'll spread out and sample more than one place. And then for the skills night, um, that's just um, a night where we have, we rent out a classroom in Burns Hall, which is one of the high rises at Clemson. Um, and then we show different students how to sample. So we'll have like a bucket of water instead of going out to the whole stream. And we just show them, this is how you dissolve the oxygen. This is how you take pH um, values. Um, so yeah, it's really fun. 
I, I really loved when you talked about the roles of the Clemson stream team, how each one of those different roles transfers to some kind of resume item, you know, whether you're the events coordinator, you're the uh, social media account manager, you know, what your roles are in keeping reagents, you know, to, up to date and that kits are stored properly and why that's important to the integrity of the data you're collecting. Like those are all different resume builders. So, um, kudos to how this uh, stream team is structured there. And then um, how are you dividing the work of sampling between 10 people is our, I think we'll have a final question then we can come back if there's additional questions after Mallory. Okay, so usually when we go to the stream, we do this part together, like the um, testing the, um, well, observing the weather conditions. So like if it's sunny, overcast, stuff like that. Um, water level clarity, we do that as a whole. And then we kind of split off into groups. So like one group will do the temperature measurements, one group will do pH, one group will do dissolved oxygen. And then there's also um, some other tests that we do like total alkalinity, nitrate, nitrogen, um, total phosphorus is one, um, but we do the, we spread it out among different people. So everyone has something to do when we're there. Okay, and I'll note that the stream habitat assessment is a great uh, part of our protocol that can be conducted in a group, um, just because you get to kind of share each other's opinions over if your stream, you know, assessment reach is 400 feet or something, you've got groups that are walking along the creek or waterway, noting, you know, leafy debris, tree debris, pools, the number of different stream elements, so the stream habitat but habitat assessment is also really well done in groups um, and total phosphorus and nitrogen they're not um, aspects of our program of the South Carolina adopt -a stream program that are covered under our QAPP but our database does include options for groups to enter data that's outside of our co-op as additional data just so you, we can provide our database as a tool for people to um, have a, a centralized spot for all of their data. So like if you're a watershed organization and you're testing E. coli, but you're also collecting an enterococcus sample that's not part of our database and you're getting it from a lab, but you can enter it so you can compare it to E. coli in one central location. So that is kind of a benefit and tool of our database when it's not a, a one size fits all kind of answer for every group. Um, thank you for the questions that are being asked for the interest. I really, I really hope that we can tell this story from another university's perspective and keep sharing these ideas uh, for student engagement. I think it's very important and, and obviously it's making a difference for the students. So, um, and we'll hear that from Mallory Ware. So Mallory was the previous president of Clemson's Dream Team and has a new job and now that she's left Clemson. So Mallory, I will stop sharing my screen so that you can start sharing yours and we look forward to hearing your story. Okay, present. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Awesome. Okay, I am Mallory Weir and I'm gonna talk a little bit about my adoptive stream experience and how that has translated to my career now. So a little information about me. I graduated from Clemson University in May of 2020 with my bachelor's degree in biosystems engineering, just like Alexis will soon. Um, I am one of the founding members and a former president of the Adopter Stream Club at Clemson. Um, and I'm currently in the Coastal Stormwater Permitting Division at South Carolina DHEC as an engineering associate. So with Adopter Stream being a citizen science program, you learn a lot of different skills. And a few technical skills that I've learned are titrating, calibrating equipment, pipetting. Um, and you'll see in this picture is part of the dissolved oxygen uh, reaction. Um, and all of those skills really did translate to my classes and labs um, that were required for my degree. Um, so it kind of gave me a sense of confidence going into those labs, already having experience with um, those technical skills. Um, and through the Adopt-A-Stream training and certification, 
Uh, I've gained an understanding of how different water quality parameters, such as dissolved oxygen, temperature, conductivity, turbidity, and the presence of certain macroinvertebrates all relate to one another. Um, and also, Alexis mentioned this, which is really cool. Um, through outreach programs uh, like Forest Fest, you learn how to discuss water quality with people of all ages, whether it's little kids or adults. Um, so that really did help communication. So do any of these skills apply to my current career? I would say yes. Um, so I currently review construction plans and applications to make sure that these project designs follow state regulations uh, and the NPDES construction general permit. So basically, uh, we ensure that proper usage of BMPs is present to present um, prevent discharge of excess sediment or pollutants, uh, and BMPs are best management practices. Um, and having this understanding of water quality really does help solidify uh, the importance of BMP usage and why we have state regulations and how construction stormwater discharge can negatively affect water quality. Um, so rather than just me checking things off of a checklist just because, I have a basis of understanding of why we have these state regulations and why it's important. Um, and Alexis actually used one of the same pictures that I have on this slide. <laughs> but at the bottom of the screen, uh, it's just a little excerpt of one of the state regulations where if you have a construction site of 10 or more acres and you have a sediment basin to catch all the excess sediment, um, you have to have a trapping efficiency of at least 80%. And so rather than just, you know, again, checking things off of a checklist and not knowing why they're there, this understanding of water quality uh, really puts more, uh, I don't know, importance of my position that I have. So did a doctor student direct my career path? Um, in a way, yes. I've always wanted an environmental related career, um, similar to Alexis's story. Um, but Adopter Stream did help lead me to South Carolina DHET. So I am not a native South Carolinian. I'm from Shelby, North Carolina. So uh, learning about Adopter Stream and how SC DHEC monitors the citizen science data that's entered did help direct me to looking at DHEC when applying for positions. Um, and the knowledge that I learned through Adopter Stream, coupled with uh, my engineering degree, uh, helps me be able to keep South Carolina's coastal counties clean, which I think is really cool. Um, and Alexis did mention some of this too. Why a Dr. Stream? Why is this an awesome uh, program to be a part of? Well, anyone can join a Dr. Stream. You don't have to have any prior knowledge or experience relating to water quality. You learn everything in training. Um, so it's not as intimidating to become a part of it because a lot of people, most citizen scientists, you know, they're just interested and want to learn more. So everyone's, everyone just wants to learn more, which is really great. Um, in fact, many of the club members weren't even in an environmentally related program of study. We had some mechanical engineers, industrial engineers, and uh, even someone in computer science. So I thought that was really cool to see people from different program areas of study joining Adopt the Stream. Um, and also these citizen science programs, such as Adopt a Stream, they help instill a sense of an environmental consciousness. Uh, they definitely foster friendships, that's for sure. And they can provide a lot of professional connections. I didn't put this in the slide, but through some of the connections and extension agents um, that I met through Adopt a Stream, I found out about other uh, creative inquiries at Clemson, and I was able to uh, be a co-author of an article published in the American Biology Teacher, which is something I never would have been a part of if I didn't meet some of these connections through Adopt Stream. Um, and in my case, it can even help direct career paths. If you don't quite know exactly where you want to work, uh, you can look at some of the, uh, you can use some of the professional connections you've gained through Adopt Stream and Clemson Extension. Um, yeah, so I'd say Adopter Stream definitely did direct me to DHEC. Um, I learned a lot more about water quality than I ever would have if I didn't join the program.
Thank you, Mallory. I went to unmute myself and my screen just like shot up. <laughs> so I apologize. Um, I'm, um, I just have to say that, uh, that these discussions, not to sound super cheesy, but you all just, you make our jobs easier. I mean, you both just did all of the work, like talking about this program and its importance that you not only make our jobs easier, but you make them more fulfilling um, because of your stories. So uh, that was that was terrific sharing. Um, and a thank you to Sierra, who is our um, co-teen leader at DHEC with the Bureau of Water. Uh, she's been um, doing some upkeep in the chat room. So thank you, Sierra, for sharing all of that. Are there any questions for Mallory? Okay. Well, um, we'll add that uh, just recently because of the coastal program, we added the transparency tube and transparency, you, your example just reminded me of this. So a transparency tube is uh, a plastic clear acrylic tube with a secchi disc at the bottom and you fill it up with water and you, you lower that water level until you can discern the black and white quadrants in the bottom of the disc. And we we are using that for the coastal program as an option instead of a secchi disc. So in our tidal saltwater program, it's, it's location, location, location. If you're monitoring along a tidal creek or from a kayak or off of a dock, you need a little bit of a different equipment uh, consideration when it comes to transparency. But when you use the transparency tube, there's a ruler along the side that also helps um, it's based on a calculation that um, approximates turbidity within the stream. And so since, unless it's trout waters, uh, DHEC and South Carolina do not have a standard for sediment to measure sediment, but we all know that sediment is a critical pollutant in our state and, um, and definitely uh, is, a, is a concern for habitat as well as how it carries other pollutants through our stream and the costs of sediment control across our state, the cost of repairing sediment uh, related issues and impacts such as dredging is humongous. So that transparency tube will be adding to the freshwater program as well. So that's something that Clemson Stream Team can start to incorporate at Honeycutt Creek, which we know can really blow through there. Um, some high power flows, um, lots of sediment movement. So um, these, again, baseline data collection, what is normal for our streams in different parts of the state? How does that change based on stream gradient? So lots of research opportunities there as well. Um, and, and how does that you know, change based on the landscape that surrounds that stream? Um, we did talk about some data collection outside of the state, and I will note that um, South Carolina adopt -a stream does have the opportunity to enter data from Georgia, from North Carolina. You can choose out of state when you're setting up that site, though we really, where we can like to refer you to that state's program. How many of the stream team members Okay, so we do have a few questions. Um, thank you for our participants for, for staying on, for um, asking questions. Uh, Beth, do you know how many creative inquiry classes are doing AAS? Um, I really don't have a handle on that. I have that I can say with 100% assurance. Um, so some of the other case studies that we could have shared today, there is a class, um, I believe it's Te Dr. Tay Hagen's. Uh, they are using AdoptaStream to measure water quality surrounding some Rocky Mountain spider lily research. So um, they're using AdoptaStream because of its low cost methods and because um, it's easy to train all of their students in the program to conduct that water quality monitoring around what is uh, helping um, those Rocky Mountain spider lilies thrive and sustain in different um, parts of, I believe it's mostly York County that she's doing that research. And then Dr. David Ladner, he's in engineering. He has students who are using AdoptaStream and uh, to do some um, studies on source water protection. So AdoptaStream, I think, is one part of their monitoring uh, protocols that they follow as a class. I don't know if those are creative inquiries. 
I'd assume they most likely are, uh, but those are two absolute research projects that I know about, but there, there may be more that I just am unaware of. Anything, Mallory or Alexis, that you're aware of that I might be missing? I used to be in Dr. Ladner's and it's a creative degree. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes. And then how many of the stream team members are certified through training workshops? So out of the 20, I want to say at least 15 of us are officially yeah. whether that be in uh, freshwater or macro or both. I was thinking it's it's practically all. And then you just have some people that kind of tag along and mm -hmm. are not tag along, but assisting, but not mm -hmm. doing the data entry. So to to the only those who are certified should be accessing the database for the data entry portion and should be doing conducting like any analysis um, in the field. However, um, anyone and for all of us who are out there monitoring, even as individual volunteers, you're bringing your family or members of your neighborhood groups, um, you're bringing them with you, you're just not accounting for them in the database because we don't need to track so many people um, within the database. We're really primarily tracking certifications, but hopefully uh, no one is out there monitoring alone. Um, but you can certainly have people that accompany you safety first um, and really uh, also that keeping you accountable, having that, doing that together, adopt in itself is being active for data collection, being outdoors towards preservate, working towards preservation and doing it together. So that's the adopt acronym for South Carolina in more or less, not, not the finished elevator speech, but more or less. <laughs> okay. If there's any other questions, um, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat room. We just have a few uh, comments before we jump off here today. Um, here's all everyone's contact information and our website. You can find uh, the center on LinkedIn. You can find us on Instagram as Clemson Watershed Center or Clemson Stream Team is the student group. Uh, certainly find us online. Uh, we just finally fixed our website. You can actually just type in scadoptastream.org right now. You can find us on Facebook, on YouTube. Uh, we just uploaded two new videos. One is um, on an improved uh, habitat assessment tutorial video. The other is how to use the transparency tube. And um, please feel free to email me. Anyone who's indicated that they're interested in follow-up, I will be in touch with you um, sometime this week. And then uh, very important for us, I've talked a little bit about our research interests um, and how we really sustain. We want citizen science to uh, be well thought of, well considered in how it's used. And we're fortunate in South Carolina that we're seeing adopted stream data being incorporated into watershed plans. Um, into local planning efforts. We have stormwater managers and MS4s that are saying, Katie, you know, we are maxed out on our budget, but we have three sites that we're curious what's happening with stormwater pollution. Do you, could you see if any of your volunteers could monitor these locations? And that's part of their NIPTES permit. So <clears throat> we do want to look at, you know, the strength and resiliency of the South Carolina adopt stream program. What motivates people to stay engaged? Are they interested in additional stewardship activities? And all of that data is collected at this bit.ly link. That survey just launched. We're about halfway to our target. So if you are a certified volunteer, please help us reach our target number of, um, of respondents and take that survey. I'll give you a second to write it down. I'll say I need water. <laughs> and then if you're not yet a certified volunteer, but you'd like to join us for a workshop on the events page at www.scadoptastream.org, our calendar regularly is updated. You can sign up for events. They are all free. No previous experience required. Uh, please attend. Um, everything uh, as far as how to get a kit, where to get a kit, where to monitor, we can help you through those questions. If you're interested in serving as a hub to bring more trainings to your area, we need those partners in energy and community engagement, people who can really um, 
speak our message locally and um, talk with neighborhoods, talk with groups that have a shared interest in environmental education. So we'd love to hear from you as well. I'll go back to the contact information and really just wanna thank everyone, double checking, making sure that we have no further questions. Yes, and our e-news, Sierra mentioned our e-news. We don't include, that. it's impossible for us to say up to date with every events in our e-news, but we have a whole lot more than just training events happening in this program. Um, lots of other news and things to keep up with, local events. So um, uh, sign up for our e-news at our website. And with that, I really very much appreciate you tuning in today. Please contact any of our state team members if we can help you um, and in any way reach your goals through the use of South Carolina adopt a stream So, and a big thanks to both of our speakers, to Alexis and Mallory. Um, the two of you have uh, shared some incredible stories. We are so lucky to be able to work with you, great people like you in this program. So um, please keep up the good work. And uh, if anyone has great job opportunities, Alexis will be graduating very soon. <laughs> so um, thank you all for, for joining us today. Have a wonderful day and a very happy Thanksgiving. Whew, I really was starting to run out of voice. <laughs> I'm going to stop our recording as everyone signs off. Thank you, everyone.